Today I have with me the concert harp, which is the largest harp that there is. It stands about six feet tall and weighs about 80 pounds. This is the instrument of the orchestra, and it developed a very special mechanism because of the chromaticism found in the 1900s and uh, 20th century as well. We're going to take a look at how this instrument has adapted to fit the chromatic scale and extended harmonies that composers wanted to use. The harp in essence is a diatonic instrument. There are seven notes spanning from this red string, which is a C. The black strings are F. And we're back to C. So there are seven unique strings before we start to repeat that color combination and pitch combination. So harpists had a problem as composers wanted to use all 12 notes of the scale and harp makers had to adapt the harp to become ready to continue to play music. And what they did is they made a mechanism here in the neck that connects through a series of long rods in the inside of this column to seven pedals at my feet. There's one pedal for each type of string on the harp. So these red strings are all controlled by one pedal at my foot. The order of the pedals from left, from where the player sits to right, is D, C, B. My right foot has four pedals, E, F, G, A. Those pedals are split and my left foot takes three and my right foot takes four. Very rarely does my foot cross over that center line and take a different pedal. Occasionally the left foot will cross over and take an E pedal, but it is uncomfortable for the harpist and not very often used. An easy way to remember the order of the pedals is from left to right, did Columbus bring enough food going abroad? Each pedal has three specific notches in which it can be. If we look at my D pedal here, we have a D flat currently set. If I move it into this middle notch, we now have a D natural. And then if I move it towards the floor, it is now a D sharp. It's a little counterintuitive for many musicians. Sharp, the sharp position is actually down towards the floor and the flat position is actually high up. Now, the way this mechanically works is when I move a pedal, these discs come and they pinch the strings. So they essentially take a string that is this long on my D, and then when I move it to the D natural position, this disc engages, and we now have a slightly shorter string, which makes it sound higher. Take, take a listen. And if I move it one more time, D natural, D sharp. So every pedal uh, controls one string and it has three positions, flat, natural, and sharp. For this reason, when we're composing, we want to think about the ability for a string to be in only one position at a time. So I can't write for a D flat and a D natural and a D sharp and expect the player to be able to do that all on the D string. Instead, it's great to get creative and start to think about enharmonic spellings. If you need a D flat and a D natural, you're gonna to need to use the D natural onto your D string and put your pedal on the C to a C sharp, which is a D flat as well. So the harp requires a bit of creative thinking, but enharmonic spellings are very common in the harp to help us work with the pedals. So the harp is a plucked stringed instrument. Many people joke that it's just the inside of a piano turned upright, but it's actually quite different in some ways. If you think about the piano, the target of the piano player is quite wide, whereas a string on a harp is very, very small. Additionally, a pianist can kind of feel their way a little bit, although they do refer to the series of black and white notes some. A harpist is very visually oriented. Um, we have the harp on our body and we are sitting on a chair or a stool, and the harp is in a different position each time we sit down, just by the nature of us being human. And so we have to refer to the colors on the harp in order to know where we're going. So visually, harpists always will have 
a bit of an attachment to being able to look at the harp. That's one of the ways we're a little bit different from a piano. Um, if I had to recommend something to composers that really um, makes the harp more complicated when you're writing is when you start to make large leaps, we really have to visually check in, whereas a pianist probably could easily make those targets and move quicker on the piano. So we do have that ability um, to make large leaps, but we do need to visually check in as well. So that slows us down a little bit more than a pianist. One of the other big differences on the harp uh, from the piano is that we do not use our pinkies. Harpists only use four fingers on each hand. That means we have a total amount of eight notes available to us at once. One of the things that I see quite often that makes harp um, writing more difficult is if somebody has composed at the piano and is writing in five finger patterns. That can be quite difficult for the harpist to do because we will run out of notes. So let's say you have a C chord and you want to have root position C chord five notes up before you repeat. A harpist has to, will have to hop with their finger and grab that extra note, whereas for a pianist that would be quite smooth and easy. That's actually quite difficult for a harpist. So patterns uh, where you are going four notes or less in one direction before you turn around or do something different are much easier for a harpist. Let's take a pattern that would be very simple for a pianist. Let's do uh, five notes in a row from C, just a C scale that goes all the way up to G. A harpist is gonna run out of fingers in four notes. So we have to cross under or leap or do something that's just slightly more difficult than um, just having five fingers at our disposal. Whereas a pianist would be able to play it quite easily. This becomes more apparent when we have a five note pattern that's very spaced out. So I'm gonna do a C chord and I'm going to take it and I'm going to do C, E, G, C and then add a fifth note, this top G up here and you'll see how difficult that is because I'm not using five fingers. Now at a slow tempo, that's okay, but look at what happens. I'm gonna reach a wall very quickly as I speed up. My accuracy very quickly devolves and I'm hitting wrong notes because I'm having to leap and catch that fifth note. Whereas on a piano, you could easily write that and feel very comfortable. Let's talk about some harp defaults. First of all, the harp is actually at a home key in C flat major. That means that there are no discs engaged on our pedal mechanism, and that means our strings are vibrating to their maximum resonance, which is something people typically look for in their harp music. Here is a C flat major chord. Now here's a C major chord. At this point, we have one disc engaged on every note to make each string a half step higher. You'll notice slightly less resonance. And then if I put my pedals all to the ground, I am now in all sharps. And you'll hear it has a bit of a brightness or tightness to the feeling because the string is now pinched in three points on, its, uh, on the top. And that's one of the reasons if you start to look more at harp music, you'll notice people tend to write in flat keys for us more than they tend to go towards sharps. Another default of the harp is that it rings. That beautiful resonance is why we, um, many of us are drawn to this instrument in the first place, but it does create some considerations while you're composing. So harp is one of those instruments that has resonance, but it doesn't sustain. So once we pluck a note, the harpist is no longer in control. And it just vibrates until the string um, is at rest. So two things to consider here. First of all, you can't write a whole note and have a crescendo for us because once we pluck a string, it's just done for us. <laughs> <laughs> we have to make our uh, dynamic lines through motion of maybe like a motor, like an eighth note pattern. 
or a series of quarter notes, something has to be able to happen and strings and notes keep needing to be um, played in order for us to make dynamic changes. We can't control the pitch after a string has been plucked. The other consideration about this is that once we pluck a string, it takes effort. We actually have to make extra effort to get rid of sound. Here's an interesting thing about the harp. I'm going to pluck a string up here. This is my middle C. And you would think, okay, she can just touch that middle C and the string will be, uh, the sound will go away. I'm assuming you can still hear the resonance and that's because my low strings, which are made of wire from the G at the bottom of the bass clef octave down, my low strings are sympathetically vibrating. So listen to what happens when I mute them instead. Quite a bit of the resonance is gone. So you can imagine if we're playing up here in our high register, it takes a lot of effort to get rid of the sound because we're having to come and hit all of the sympathetically vibrating strings. So if you want a harpist to be able to get rid of the resonance, you really need to plan ahead and give him or her time to put their hands back onto the instrument. So it's actually another whole notion that takes a bit of effort. So you wouldn't want to have um, a very active part where they're having to muffle after each note and then find their strings again. It's very difficult. That brings us to staccatos. Staccatos are um, interesting on the harp, how about? Let's take a look at them. With our left hand, we can do something that's called étouffé. It's a French word which means to strangle or muffle. And with this in the single note, we, we come back to the string very quickly with a flat hand and we muffle it. Now it's easiest on one note. We can make it happen for octaves as well. You'll notice you do hear that sound as we come back to the string, almost sounds like a walking bass of sorts. Our right hand cannot do a flat hand muffle and often our right hand and left hand technique is slightly different because our right arm is supporting the harp and it's very hard to get our hand in flat. Um, it's very uncomfortable. So our left hand has the ability to be flat and do things a little differently than our right. So our right hand, we can do single finger um, staccatos. But uh, again, because the harp is naturally very resonant and rings, it takes an extra motion to come back to that. So you actually have to think about giving the harpist a little bit of time um, to make that action happen. Another default of the harp is that we roll our chords typically. Um, because of the way the harmonic series is released, when we roll on the harp, uh, it is just considered typically more pleasant. Now we can play our chords not rolled. Here is an unrolled chord. And we are happy to do that if you ask us. You just put an upright bracket next to the chord. However, the default, if you don't have any direction on the chord, is each harpist will roll the chord a little bit or a lot. How much is up to the harpist? And that can be one of the tricky things about that communication between harpist and composer, which is how will you know how much roll you get? You won't. Um, that will be up to the taste of the harpist. So hopefully your harpist is listening to the style of the music and reacting to it. And I guess, isn't that the wonderful thing about live music? Um, if you really want it to be rolled though, you can put, it's like the glissando wavy line, but it's upright. And we will know that you definitely want a healthy roll to your chord. So another thing about the harp is that we will have this resonance after we get done playing and the harpist will have kind of their default amount of resonance they allow to ring. Um, so if you haven't given us any direction, you're leaving it up to the harpist. But at the end of the phrase, you can put a tie to nothing or the initials LV, which is technically for laissez vibrer or let vibrate. And we will know to just let it naturally decay to its end, which can be some time. Um, or you can put the muffle sign, which is actually a coda. And that is how a harpist knows to get rid of some 
sound, or you can also just put the text muffle. So let's talk about what you can expect if you are hiring a pedal harpist. This is a concert grand harp. It's 47 strings. Our lowest note is a C, two octaves below the bass clef staff. And our highest note is a G, two octaves above the treble clef staff. So we have just under the range of a piano. Um, something to know is that our first octave and five strings is made of wire and they have a very boomy sound to them. Another thing to know about our low range is the C and the D at the bottom of the harp do not have the pedal mechanism on them. It's not, um, there's not enough space for there to be a pedal mechanism there. So the two lowest strings are not controlled by the pedals. You need to write for either a C natural, a C sharp, or a C flat, and that is set from the very beginning on that C string by the harpist tuning it manually. Same thing with the D. When you compose a piece, that low D has to either be a D flat the whole time, a D natural, or a D sharp the whole time. So the bottom two strings do not have a mechanism on it. And then some harps, the very top G does not have a mechanism, although the main brand in the United States, Lion and Healy, does have that G sharp mechanism. So our right hand typically takes the higher notes on the harp, and our left hand typically takes the lower notes on the harp, although we can cross over just like a pianist would. The harmonics are a very special effect on the harp. It's where we cut the string in half by muting it with part of our hand, and then we pluck with another part of our hand. The resulting sound is a bell-like timbre one octave higher. So here's my regular string. And now I'm gonna play the same string as a harmonic. There are two schools of thought with harmonics. The um, older school of thought is that a harmonic is um, notated where it is played, and then it will result in an octave up on the sound. In the 1900s, there was a harpist named Carlos Silzedo who tried to make a um, change in notation where composers would actually put the harmonic where it would sound, and the harpist would then play an octave lower. So that's good to know. Um, you might want to be clear if you're going to write harmonics, which of those two styles you're using. Harmonics sound best in uh, the middle range of the harp. Once you get onto the wire strings, you leave the get strings of the center. It gets a little, it gets a little harder to make a good sound. The other thing is, is um, as you get higher, the string gets so small that it's very hard for us to fit the proper um, length of our hand in to get a good sound. So the top range of the harmonic is thought to be the very top of the treble clef where that G is. As you can see, this is another instance where the right hand has a different technique from the left. Our left comes in flat, And our right arm, because it's busy supporting the harp, cannot come in this direction, so we actually mute with a knuckle of our second finger and pluck with our thumb. Now I said that G was the highest note that you should write for, but you actually do have harmonics a little bit higher. As you can see, I can get to them, but it's very iffy and uh, the consistency is very difficult and um, it's just not terribly recommended by harpists. You don't make harp friends by writing above G on a, on a harmonic. Our left hand, because we're flat, we can actually play two notes of harmonics. This is limited to the interval of a second, very close together, third and fourth 
Many of us can reach a fifth, but it is a lot harder and less consistent again. So you would want to make sure you either know your harpist well, or you are giving them lots of time to get set up and properly get a fifth. Now remember, the left hand is playing things differently than the right. So a right hand can only play a single harmonic. We cannot get a double harmonic. But through a combination of left hand and right hand, we can take two notes in the left and one in the right and get a beautiful chord. Another thing to consider about harmonics is our left hand has a bit of a range difference from the right hand. Our left hand, because we're coming in flat, typically we stop using our left hand for harmonics at the G above middle C. So that's the G in the center of the treble clef staff. As we get up here, it's just too hard to have our hand going in this direction. So our right hand takes over from there on up. So you um, should modify your writing and not do any double harmonics probably above middle C, D, or E. Many composers ask me, what is their responsibility for marking in pedals? And um, you could ask one harpist this question and get 10 answers. Don't ask two harpists because you'll end up with 50 answers. So there is really no right or wrong. And through the years, here's what I've come up with as my best practices. I like to have composers write in the pedals so that they know they are achievable. Now, if your harpist is not going to be sight reading your part for a recording session, I would recommend removing the pedals and letting the harpist write them in him or herself. This is because harpists are very particular about where they like to see the pedals. Some harpists prefer to see the pedals below the staff. I personally put the pedals in between the two staves and um, some pedals are marked early for some harpists. Some harpists like them right next to the note that they're used for. So if you ever get your part back and the harpist has rewritten your pedals, it's not that you've done something wrong, it's just that they have a preference that um, was different than yours. So I always recommend that you write the pedals in so you know that it's possible. How do you know if a pedal is possible? There's a few things to consider. First, there's the resonance. It's very hard for us to move a pedal cleanly with resonance going on. So here's a C chord, and let's pretend we wanna to go to a C augmented by making a G sharp right after that. I'm imagining you heard that pedal change where that G went die. So in order to make a clean pedal change, we would have to come back to the strings, muffle the sound briefly, and then move our pedal. So you want to think about what is ringing and keeping in mind that the low notes are going to be ringing more than the high notes because these small strings have a quicker decay than and so forth. So if you have low C's ringing, It can be quite some time before I can change a pedal or I need to get rid of the sound before I change a pedal. So one of the things about knowing how to write well for pedals is to think about what's ringing, how much resonance you're desiring, because if you want a staccato note with a quick half step change, that's fine, we can do that. But if you want it to be this beautiful legato line, it's very hard for us to cleanly do that and have a half step change in the middle. So returning back to that idea of what do you write in the part for the harpist? Harpists have, some, have something called a pedal diagram. This is a visual representation of what our, uh, the pedals at our feet look at like at any given moment. And I think of it more as a tool that is for the player rather than the composer. Um, some composers have taken to writing the pedal diagrams and then um, when they have a change in pedals they write another pedal diagram. The reason I feel this isn't the most useful tool uh, way to do this is because when we have two diagrams we have to compare them. So let's say you have a diagram that shows B, um, B flat major and then later on you show us a diagram that is G major we have to think, oh, what key am I in from way back there at the top of the page? 
And then what has changed to this physical little uh, thing of dots and dashes from below the page. So it's really not the most efficient way to write changes. So accidentals are really the best way to show that um, and be really certain that you're getting what you want. And that goes for glissandi as well. Uh, some composers will just mark the squiggly line for a glissandi and give me a pedal diagram, but it's very easy for your brain to get tangled up when it's three in the morning and you're writing these parts. Um, you might forget that C flat is up instead of down and do your diagram wrong. So what I always recommend is for glissandi to write out an octave of the scale and then do the glissando line. And that way we can see any naturals, flats and sharps that you want and confirm that the scale is right. And then the pedal harpist will typically put in their own diagram. Let's talk glissandi. Glissando in Italian means to glide, and it's one of the things the harp is most famous for. And it's very satisfying as a player to run your fingers up and down the strings and experience that beautiful resonance. So let's first talk about what you can do with the harp that makes the glissandi so special. Thinking back to our pedals, sometimes they're a bit of a hassle when we have accidentals and so forth, and we're trying to write properly for the harp. But in a glissando, those pedals really pay off because we have some cool things we can do. Through the enharmonics that are available to us, we can actually double some of the notes and eliminate other notes in the scale when we're gliding. So let's take a look. Um, let's just start with a C and a D. Now, when we get to our E, let's think about what we can do creatively here and let's make it an E sharp. So effectively, we've taken all the E's on our harp and made them into an F by putting our pedal to E sharp. Now, the interesting thing about a harp is we still have an F string. So we have two strings on the harp in that octave that are the same note. And we've actually eliminated the half step in the scale as well. So G natural, we can't get to that inharmonically. A natural, can't get to that inharmonically. But let's think of what we could do with our B that would make something a little more interesting than just a regular B natural. Let's take our B and make it a B sharp. And again, we've effectively taken our B string and made all of the Bs into C strings. But we still also have our red C strings, so we have two Bs. And we again have eliminated the half scale, uh, the half note in our scale. Let's take a listen to what that sounds like. And there you have that classic harp sound. So um, there is a world of possibilities if you start getting into inharmonics and different types of scales. For instance, you could write a glissando. Let's do a B sharp. And then let's set up C flat. Now I have two strings that typically pitch wise are lower and higher B to C. Now my B is higher than my C. All right, let's see what we can do with that. Uh, let's do a regular D. Let's do an E flat, let's do an E sharp and an F flat. And let's see what that sounds like now that they're um, out of order. So a really interesting run that is so simple for the harpist, but because we thought creatively with our pedals, the um, pitches are actually kind of jumping around a little bit and making a really cool kind of scale. Another question composers often ask is how do I notate what I want as far as the motion of a glissando? There's obviously the straight line up and the straight line down. You can also put ad lib if you are okay with the harpist just kind of listening to the music and making sweeps and swoops as he or she sees fit. Um, I've even seen somebody compose big harpo marks glisses. They put the text there and I knew exactly what to do. Right? Until the music was over. 
Um, so you do have the option to give the harpist this idea of direction and leaving it up to them through an ad lib or some sort of um, marking like that. Or you can take the glissando marks and kind of give a road map that goes up and down and around. The other thing is how do we start and end the gliss? If you really want that first note to be um, really solid, I would recommend writing an accent underneath it so we know to maybe pluck with one hand and then start the gliss. Same thing with the ending. If you really want that end note to be kind of very bold and on arrival, I always recommend putting an accent on it. Um, you can just write it, the end note that you want in there, and the harpist typically should land on it. Um, but if you really want it accented I would um, and heavy, I would put an accent on it. The other option is you can have the gliss go to nowhere, and we will just kind of look at the range of where you've written that gliss line and kind of let it fade out into nothing and not have an arrival point. Let's contrast that with if you had written a C at the top. So two very different transitions, and you might want to think about what you're looking for with that kind of upward motion of the gliss or downward motion of the gliss and how you want that final um, sound to end. So going back to our cousin, the piano, um, there's one other big difference between the piano and the harp, and that is actually the span of um, range we can reach with one hand. A harpist can easily hit an octave. Even children with small hands can do that on a harp. Our max that you should write for is a tenth, is quite comfortable on a harp. Both hands can do the, uh, the interval of a tenth. Now because of the harp's resonance, you might want to take advantage of this ability to have the chords opened up instead of close. Take a listen to this close scored chord. It's C, E, G, and the notes are as close as possible, um, meaning I've stacked them in thirds. As you can hear, because of the immense resonance of the harp, it gets a little bit muddy and boomy, which might be a sound you're looking for, in which case go for it. But for many composers, it doesn't fit well with what they're trying to orchestrate. So an option is then to open the chord. So what I'm going to do is have the same C and the same G, but I'm going to take the E and I'm going to bring it out on a tenth, which again is very, um, very capable in a harpist's hand, and we're going to have a nice open chord. So a very different unlocking of the resonance, depending on if you have your, um, your voicings open or closed. Another thing to think about is, again, we are only using four fingers on our hands, not five. So when you're writing a chord, you want to probably keep it to eight notes max. A harpist can play more than eight notes in a chord, but it requires crossing over and remembering that um, very basic idea I gave, which is we are visually based and a hop is a little bit harder. Our roll will have to be quite spread out and it just um, exponentially is harder for us to have to cross over. So here's like a, um, a more than eight note chord. As you can hear, it almost sounds arpeggiated because I have to give myself time to get up to that um, crossover. So let's talk about changing the timbre of the harp. Um, there are a few things that are very common. The first one is called pra de la table, or close to the soundboard. And that is a change in location on the strings. So our most resonance is here in the center. And pra de la table, this is our soundboard or table, is down here close to the wood and therefore has less resonance. So it's going to sound more nasal and uh, sharp, almost guitar-like. So here's the center resonance. de la table. Now that takes a little effort on the behalf of the harpist. We're not as agile down here. 
That's about as fast as I can go down on Preda La Tabla, whereas up here, I have a lot more um, agility. So you just wanna give a little extra time for the harpist to get down there and do things on Preda La Tabla, but it's a very effective, very piercing timbre that can sometimes be um, combined very interestingly with other instruments in the orchestra too. You can also ask the harpist to go bon de la corde, which is just halfway between the middle and the bottom. So it's typically a very clean sound. It eliminates a bit of the resonance, but it does not get the nasal quality of pre de la table. So here is middle, bon de la corde, just a little more articulation and pre de la table. All of these positions are considered um, pretty standard extended techniques for the harp, as well as harmonics. You can write them and any harpist should know um, what is being asked of him or her. Some other things you can do are low palm clusters, which is when we take an open hand. This is known sometimes as a gong hit as well, and we strike the strings and get that really kind of cluster effect. Um, another thing we can do is called xylo. And with any of the ones I'm talking about now, the palm clusters and the xylo effect, you might want to include a little bit of extra direction to your harpist because it's um, fairly common and becoming more common now for harpists to know this, but you might run across people that just need a little more direction. So xylo, one hand is eliminated from making sound. And instead, it goes to the bottom of the strings and makes a little bit of a muffle. And then the other hand comes and plucks those same strings. So a couple things to think about here is one hand is eliminated, so you need to think about how many notes you can write for. And it takes a bit of work to get your hand cleanly on the string down there without making noise. So give your harpist time to prepare. And you wanna kind of limit it to, four notes is most comfortable, but I guess we can use our pinkies. We're just not used to it very much. Um, so we, you wanna limit it to about four or five notes. And if you want to go beyond that range, you have to give the harpist time to get prepared. You can see it took me a little bit and it wasn't very fluid to get to the rest of that scale. Um, xylo effect up top gets slightly less effective because our hand is so our fingers are big enough that it starts to affect the pitch. But about the um, within the treble clef staff and the bass clef staff, xylo is a fun and uh, appropriately written extended technique. Let's take a look at an excerpt from Shostakovich's Symphony No. 5, the third movement. So this is one of my absolute favorite um, excerpts. It's actually the harp and the celeste combined um, in unison, and it makes an amazing sound. And it's also a great example of really effective harmonic writing. If you look at the score, not a terrible amount of people are playing, and they're very soft, so it really allows this gentle kind of bell-like sound to blossom. It actually starts out with notes that are being played regularly, and then it transitions into harmonics. And that is something harpists can do. We can be playing normally, and then we just need a little bit of an extra second, but we can, within a, a nice leisurely tempo like this excerpt, we can switch to harmonic very easily. A great example of the chromaticism you can achieve through some really clever pedal um, strategy is out of Scheherazade, Rimsky-Korsakov, 
an expert orchestrator, of course, um, knew his stuff with a harp as well. Another common excerpt that we get asked to play for orchestral auditions is Ravel's Piano Concerto in G Major. There is a harp cadenza in the first movement that is just so beautiful, and it's a fantastic example of both glissandi and harmonics. Um, Ravel really knew what he was doing, and this is just so wonderful. So our right hand is going to be doing these atmospheric glissandi, and he's said glissandi appear, uh a glissandos at your pleasure. So he's given some lines that give us direction, but then he stops giving those lines and we know that we actually are in control of where our glissandi are going and how they move. And then the left hand is doing a combination of harmonics and chords. He then goes on to change the glissando and very smartly puts a fermata on the end note has the strings continue the sound, another fermata for the harpist to get prepared with the pedals for the next glissando. And now for one of our most famous excerpts, which is the Waltz of the Flowers, the cadenza from Tchaikovsky's Nutcracker. Um, the funny thing about this is it's so well known. I'm sure you already have kind of the sound of it in your ears, but did you know that no harpist plays it as Tchaikovsky wrote it? Tchaikovsky wrote a series of 16th notes in both hands in contrary motion. quite bulky and it gets very, very weighed down. So I don't know how long this has been going on, but I have never heard anybody play it that way. Um, we all tend to split it up and double the rhythm. And instead of going, we go cascading down. Instead. So, um, here is the Waltz of the Flowers uh, cadenza from the Nutcracker Suite.